Sounds good. A handle. All right. I think good. I think that's good. All right. But uh, yeah. Oh man, water and everything. Yeah. Man, um, you're well, big time. <laughs> that's more because um, in my experience, if you've got dry mouth, oh, all, yeah, pretty yeah. much all you're gonna hear is. <laughs> all right. Now I'm thinking about it. So. <laughs> <clears throat> So, uh, how you been? What, what have you been doing? You know, I'm <clears throat> busy, but good busy. Uh, perfect example. Like yesterday, I started out my day. I had two hours of lifting and running for football and then various exciting errands and then a three hour football camp to end the night with our, but it was cool. It was, um, our players kind of ran all the drills for the younger kids mm -hmm. and, uh, it's great because, you know, since I'm from Torrington and I love this place, it just makes me happy to see our players, you know, stepping up and helping younger kids make memories. So, you know, I'm trying to help support these kids for them to grow and then to see them do those kind of things and be so great with the young kids and help the young kids create memories. It's, it's awesome. So that's sort of my, it's nothing exciting, but it's the life that I want to lead. You know, I love it. It's, right. you know, so it's summer. I wouldn't call summer vacation because I'm really busy. But it's certainly time away from school to recharge and, you know, so that's a pretty typical day for me. And you're still teaching physics, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's the subjects can change for me, um, but physics and always some combination of maths. Yeah. So we're still throwing bowling balls out the window, you just, which you remember you, you said well. You maths right there? Maths, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Where'd you pick that up? <laughs> uh, you know, probably the kids. I don't know. That's how I keep up with my rap, you know, with it, the kids. No, I mean, it's not... <laughs> You realize, like, maths is a rather European way to say math? You know, I don't know if I Which pick... I suppose grammatically makes sense, because the full word is mathematics. Oh, there you go, yeah. But, of course, in American English, people tend to say just math. Yeah. And then in, like, British English, they, they say maths. Hmm. Well, the higher level version of it, that it was a concentrated choice based on what probably makes sense grammatically, is not where it came from for me. <laughs> Where'd it come from? <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, maybe pick it up from the kids. I don't know. Ah, these kids. I know, right? And their math. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, are you still in the same room and all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely, uh, you know, that was a surreal thing. Like, since I graduated from the high school, you know, I to take over in the room that, that I took physics in as a student it was pretty cool. So uh, so I love it. I mean, the whole science -y heat rises thing, you know, the first month of school and the last month of school are pretty rough temperature wise but that fact aside i love teaching in the room that i took physics in as a student hmm. yeah you might remember how hot it got in there I don't oh know. uh probably yeah yeah was. especially because i was wearing um like baggy clothes and yeah. um i think it was just like jeans every day <laughs> because i was uh insecure about my body well you certainly aren't the only person so but i'm glad that uh you've got this new adventure going because uh, as soon as you reached out to me, it definitely gave me like a big old smile. I'm like, yep, that sounds about right that he would <laughs> dive into a podcast. Yeah. So it was pretty awesome. Now, um, I have not seen you in... Well, when did you graduate? Quite a, quite a few years, 2014. All right, there you I go. I graduated from Torrington High School in 2014. So there you go, five years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, were, you were always one of my favorite teachers. Um, for one, you were just fun. And you were, you really tried to cater to, um, the needs of the class in terms of, uh, like rationing time in t to uh, take care of whatever, say, experiment we were doing at the time. And really, uh, on top of making sure we like got our stuff done and we had ample time to do it. I'm glad to hear you say that because, um, you know, one of the things as teachers that we have to battle a lot is, you know, pressures of, you know, you have to cover everything that's in the curriculum. You have to make sure kids are ready for standardized tests, that kind of stuff. And um, I'm more about the connection with the kids that I have in my room. What do they need right in front of me right now? So I'm glad to hear that your recollection from five years ago is that, you know, I tried to do things in a way that, hey, what makes sense for us? What do we need to do right now? Because that's certainly how I try to do it. Yeah. You mentioned you've lived in Torrington all your life, right? Yeah, baby. When did you go to Torrington High? I graduated in 1990. I just turned 47. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, you know, I love this place. You know, when I, when I went, and it's always been that way, when I went away to college, so that's the first time, because I 
I lived at school and it was in Massachusetts. It's the first time I was really around people not from Torrington for any meaningful length of time. And probably once a week, somebody would say like, why are you so proud of like where you're from? Like, I get it. Like, they're like, you know, I'm fine with where I live, but it's like, you love the place. Yeah, pretty much. I do. That's why I'm here. And where did you go for undergrad? I went to WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. In Worcester. You got it. Okay. Yep. And you studied? Well, my degree was in civil engineering. And, um, you know, I, which certainly is not like a ready fit with education, but I remember my senior year, my physics teacher, John Duffy used to be an engineer and then he became a teacher. And so I thought he was the perfect person to sort of ask for his advice because that was literally what I was thinking as I was sort of making my choices for college. I was interested in engineering, but I was also interested in teaching and the advice he gave me. And I'm glad I took it was you know, if there's one that you're sure of, do it and don't look back. But he said, if you're literally 50, 50, get the engineering degree, because if you want to switch over to teaching, it's not that hard to switch. But if you go in the other direction, you go and get a degree in education. And then you want to switch over to engineering. He said, you pretty much have to start over. And I'm glad I followed that advice because I was in the big, bad engineering world for about a year and a half before I said, okay, teaching and coaching it is. Hmm. Now, I have some familiarity with what engineering means. Sure. What does civil engineering mean? You know, that's a good question. What does that entail? Yeah. Um, well, engineering is really just solving problems and finding more efficient ways to do things. Uh, and, and invariably, it ties into, you know, kind of math-based and science-based skills, the maths, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so so really, engineering is kind of an umbrella term. Um you know, so you could talk to two different people that both say they're civil engineers and their jobs could be wildly different. I think the probably the most traditional thing people think of with civil engineers is uh, the people who design the structures for buildings and highways and things like that. And that certainly is, um, you know, I took sort of civil engineering 101 kind of classes right off the bat that were all those kind of things with uh, bridges and whatnot. Um, but really what my I did was uh, the focus was in environmental engineering. So it would look at a combination of building, but also incorporate like the hydrology and the the soil and, and, and like the water flow and things like that. And ultimately the job I had, it was a great job. I have no complaints about the job. It's just ultimately it wasn't what I wanted to do involved. Um, you know, if there were chemical spills and oil spills and things like that coming in, collecting soil samples, analyzing them, seeing what needed to be cleaned up, and then, you know, based on the hydrology and the soil mechanics and all that, trying to figure out the best way to clean it up. So, um, which so that's day to day. That's certainly very different than someone who's designing a bridge. So there's a lot of things that fall under the general umbrella of civil engineering, I think. So it's all <clears throat> pretty much engineering to serve a city. Yeah, I, I think you could probably say that. I mean, Pretty much to serve civilization. There uh, we go. That's yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's not unusual. Pretty much every, every town of at least decent size has like a town engineer. And that's probably the most common background is they're a civil engineer. Oh, okay. Yeah. And how about you? What do you have on me? For University of Hartford? What do you, uh, Oh, I am, I'm majoring in film and English at the University of Hartford. Film and English. Okay. All right. So when you say film, are you, actively like uh making films yes yes all right cool yeah pretty much yeah i don't know if you've um you know who peter jackson is peter jackson the director of the lord of the rings heck yes and um, also the lovely bones <laughs> oh there there you go very good and also the hobbit i was just gonna say i noticed you cringed when you said the hobbit um but also heavenly creatures that's but, oh that, <laughs> oh wow that's going old school look yeah. at you man you know what's up of course you're a film major so you should well i haven't seen half these films <laughs> okay <laughs> you know they're all there, yeah so the part the part it the film nerd is me memorizing stuff right because you know and, it's in the and knowing like references to right. films i haven't seen yeah yeah sure but that's the starting <laughs> point and then you know if those references catch you enough i suppose you watch it but anyway where i was going with that was um you could borrow from me if you want um he's got a a book that um was written about him and basically just his journey to become a filmmaker and i just love the way he did it because he did not follow the traditional route he kind of talks about when he grew up he had a love for art and those kind of things and he would just sort of make his own little home movies and create his own special effects and that's actually how he started out was he envisioned himself becoming a special effects person 
but just from sheer power of will, he basically forced himself into the industry and didn't go any sort of way that you would expect, but he was just so passionate about it that here we are and he's doing all these movies and, um, yeah. So. And producing was Steven Spielberg. Oh yeah. Yeah. He uh, did a, they, um, they co-produced that movie, uh, from 2011, the adventures of Tintin. Yes. I really enjoyed that. I don't know if you saw that one. Or yeah, right. I yeah. Did, I did see it yeah. uh, recently and, uh, it was fun. It was yeah, fun. I agree. I enjoyed that. And, and also I really loved his version of King Kong. I know a lot of people said it was really bloated, and, I, uh, yeah, I haven't seen it, Yeah, but it's like three and a half hours long or something. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I loved it. And there's certainly some scenes that, you know, you know, I think add to the texture of the film and, you know, like the depth of it, you know, like anything you could streamline it, but I don't know, in my opinion, it's supposed to be entertainment. Like, you know, if you're just looking for the most ultra lean efficient thing, like, I don't know. Watch a Woody Allen movie. Yeah. Or, right. Yeah. And I just lied there because even though I know who Woody Allen is, I never watched one of his movies all the way through. So, <laughs> so I just succumbed to the pressure of being. They're all like guru. ninety minutes. You could do it <laughs> <laughs> if you sat through King Peter Jackson's King Kong. You can sit through a Woody Allen movie. That's, that's half fair. the length. Okay, all right. <laughs> I put that on my to do list. Not even like you haven't seen any Hall in full. No, no. You know, again, I've heard. References some of these movies and seen some of the scenes, but I've never sat down. I'll be honest with you. I, I enjoy movies, but typically more of the lowbrow variety. So I haven't seen too many older things. Not too many. <laughs> you're, too bu- you're too busy watching like Super Troopers or something. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I guess I find uh, a lot of value apparently in watching like the original Karate Kid for like the 37th time. I mean, that one's not so lowbrow. It's just... It, I, I just see it as a uh, a, de- a decent movie. I, I it's not it, like yeah. um, real kind of stupid. Yeah, like you would say, like something by the guys who made Super Troopers, right? Uh, Broken Lizard. They oh, they made stuff one. like Beer Fest. Or, oh, sure, okay, or, right, you know, right, right. Those right. Are kinda, yeah, you're you right. Know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Or stoner comedies or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> not that they can't have their enjoyment, but yeah. So, did you start out with uh, the film in English from day one? No, um, there, it, it's a complicated story. So, well, this might interest you. Uh, right after high school, right after I graduated from Torrington High, I enrolled as a physics major at the University of Connecticut. Okay. However, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, it, it wasn't my bag. Yeah, that's um, good. Because when I, when I was growing up, um, the thought was always, hey, bookish, studious, Asian, Sure. Um, sciences, math and science, maths right. and science. <laughs> and that just seemed, that was the cookie cutter, um, right. path that I thought would fit me. But of course, um, that it didn't. At some point, I became disillusioned with my education and this plan I had for myself to be like, say, I think at the, at the time, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Right. But the thing is, I would say I would say I still have the brain to do that, but at some point I lost the ambition. I dropped out of school, floundered about for like a year, year and a half. It was in the middle of watching a movie that I realized the only things that I really cared about were arts and entertainment. And so really the reason I became so dejected and dropped out of school and didn't want to do anything was because I started playing music. Um, I picked up a guitar and such, and all I wanted to do was you know, play guitar and get and try to be a musician. You would think for someone who loved music as much as me, the, the, uh, the obvious choice would have been, Hey, you should go to music school. Right. Right. But not really because I had just started playing during my senior year of high school right. and I wasn't, um, you know, it was, I was playing guitar. I wasn't learning to read music or whatever. Right. So I would not even a year's worth of like uh fervent practice and study would would not be enough for me to uh, develop the proficiency in order to enter a program in music somewhere. Sure. Your trajectory was different to go all physics <clears throat> Yeah. I thought, what? okay, what's the way for me to get into the arts? That's not music because I'm just not a good musician sure. yet, yet or never will be. It occurred to me, it's film. Yeah. It's film because... To me, that's like the ultimate culmination of all the arts. 100%. It's writing, directing, acting, music, uh, cinematography, slash photography, production design, costume design, et cetera. 
And so at that point, I knew, okay, this is it, film. Good for you. So I enrolled at the community college where I earned a degree in uh, an arts field, fine art, uh, digital media, because that, w- that was the major they had. That was the closest thing to filmmaking since the one of the main bits of digital media is videography. Right. And um, now, and then I've since transferred to the University of Hartford where I am um, um, made double majoring in film and English. Right. And now with a minor in music. Awesome. But it was, again, it was not always like that. Most people who are smart, not me, go to community college to get, to take care of their general education requirements. Right. But I didn't. I earned a very specific degree in an art field. Right. And all those art classes I took would really help if I were, say, enrolled in the Harvard Art School. Right. But I am not. Right. I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences where film and English are housed. And so, but and not only that, but I was, I was initially accepted to university solely as a film major. Okay. And, and I would have, I would have been in and out, say, two-ish years, right? But... I thought a degree in film is not doing me many favors. So the only other thing I would tolerate studying is English. Right. I guess I'll double major in that. Sure. But of course, a degree in English is also not doing me many favors. The only real, I think the only, one of the only real things you can do with an English degree is teach. And I saw they had their own program where you can get certified to teach high school as you earn your English degree. Okay. And so I thought, oh, I guess I'll do that too. And then I added a minor in music for some reason. <laughs> so it's like film, English, yeah. education certification. It's almost like triple majoring right. plus that minor. Yeah. And so it's going to be four-ish years of me going going to school to fulfill sure. all these programs for my bachelor's. Sure. All right. Well, I would encourage you, first of all, to be a little not so harsh on yourself. Like, and I know we're just kind of talking off the cuff here, but when you said like, uh, you know, you floundered around for a little bit, you weren't floundering around. You were reflecting and figuring out where do I want to go? You know, like I was also buying all this equipment because I wanted to start a podcast, but then then but then it, it was four years too late. I'm starting it now. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's you can't be expected to know everything up front. And I understand what you're saying. You you alluded to the fact that you kind of, you know we're kind of fulfilling like a stereotype that you kind of thought like, this is the path that I have to follow. But, you know, the sooner people follow in life, you know, the life they want to lead rather than the life they think they're supposed to, the better off they're going to be. So what are you, 23? Yes. Yeah. So the fact that you've already kind of had that reflection and done a course correction, that's a great thing. And it's nothing you need to, you know, describe in terms of floundering around because that's, you know, I know, I know lots of people my age that are miserable doing what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and everybody's story is unique, but when all is said and done, lots of them spent too much time doing what they thought they had to do. I still feel a bit, um, behind, if you could say, because I earned my associate's degree at 22 when I should have gotten a bachelor's. And now I'm spent, and now it's almost like I'm starting all over doing a full four years to get a bachelor's and then. You know, by the time I graduate, I will have my degree and no health insurance. You know, certainly, I think the paths that we choose, there's obviously consequences to those paths. But again, I, I like when you just said, like, you were too late, like, you're not too late. Like, part of the reason, and again, we haven't seen each other in, you know, five years, but I can certainly just see already, just in the time before we kind of sat down to talk and then now, you know, you're obviously passionate about what you're doing and very focused. And part of that, I'm sure, came from the circuitous path you took. You know, if you just went to it right off the bat, there would have been a lot less reflection into it, a lot less hard work leading up to it. So, you know, I just certainly sounds like you're going to make sure you get the most of it now because you, you know, all your previous experiences just really affirm for you, no, this is the path I want to follow with a lot of conviction, you know, and you might not have been there if you right off the bat kind of went that way. But I also feel kind of guilty because, you know, I'm, I'm a from, I come from a family of immigrants. Mm-hmm. And so the usual itinerary 
uh, immigrant parents might have for their kids sure. is not do the arts. Do, I understand. Do, try to try to gain, like get a degree in something practical so you could make money and survive. Yeah, I certainly and not waste your energy on such frivolous things. Right, because you can always pursue that later on the side on your own. Hmm? Right. No, I totally get that, and it's you know knowing that you know that kind of good thoughtful person you are that doesn't surprise me that's foremost in your mind and i understand that dynamic um but you know life is long you know i'm sure you'll more than be able to make your family proud in terms of you know getting out there living a life you're passionate about and working hard and but i certainly understand that you know that guilt that comes with not following the straight and narrow path that's you know utterly bankable and you know, like a very obvious way to sort of thank your family for, you know, making the sacrifices so that you could pursue those paths. Like I get where that comes from, certainly. And it's ultimately, it's a good thing, that driving factor, but that's going to make you be a success in the path you've chosen. I suppose. Yeah. But I, I understand that because again, everybody's situation is unique, you know, but I was raised by a single mother who um, did not graduate high school. And so for my whole life, she was working three jobs, you know, and never took time for herself, never spent any money on herself. And, uh, you know, so when I saw how hard she worked to give me opportunities that she didn't have, um, certainly I look back and there's, you know, things that, you know, kind of quote unquote wasted opportunities. And some of them were, you know, I was being lazy. I was foolish, you know, didn't capitalize on opportunities. And, um, you know, so it's not about being perfect. Nobody's perfect, but, you know, always forward. Do you think that um, that upbringing you had, it did it. Was it the kind of thing that gave you the drive? Really lit a fire on you to to achieve and make sure the the effort your mother put in right well, was was really worth it. You know, I think it's. I think yes, but it was kind of on a slow burn. Where you know, because even at a young age, as meaning as a teenager, I mean that's young to me as a forty seven year old. Um, you know, I certainly recognized the sacrifices that my mother made for me. And I was appreciative, but probably like a lot of teenagers, I was ultimately more self-centered than, you know, you would ideally want to be, but we're, you know, as people, we grow, you know, we're not instantly where we should be. And if, if we've tapped out at 17 in terms of growth, then something's wrong anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think each year that goes by, I continue to marvel at and grow an appreciation for the sacrifices my mother made when I see how hard it is to sort of day to day to do the things that you need to do. So I certainly think that that helped drive me forward. And I think that's part of the reason, and you might um, remember from your time in my class, you know, I think I tend to be insanely enthusiastic and positive in my efforts to try and help kids. And I think a lot of it is just that ingrained appreciation I have for, I know I was lucky to have a mother who sacrificed everything for me. So, you know, with that gift, I mean, I, I consider myself very lucky and I appreciate the fact that that created the opportunity for me to try and do the same thing for kids coming up in town now. So I certainly, um, was shaped by an appreciation for the sacrifices my mother made for me. Do you have any siblings? I do. Um, I have, uh, a sister, and uh, a brother that uh, my mother remarried when I was older. So I'm more, really more like an uncle to them because of the age difference. How um, big is that? Well, I'm 10 years older than my sister and 13 years older than my brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm really more like an uncle. I, when I was in high school, I had to... Hi, uncle brother. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, I definitely had to split my time between, you know, handling business with schoolwork, part-time job, being with friends and whatnot, but also, okay, tonight you're you know, watching your brother and sister because we're doing whatever. Mm. So did that almost give you like a early crash course in say taking care of children? Yeah, it definitely did. Um, you know, because when I was, you know, 17, a senior in high school, my brother and, um, and sister were, you know, seven and four. So, you know, I definitely, um, grew up recognizing like the gravity of what it's like to take care of someone, who needs that help and, you know, just the day-to-day things of, you know, making dinner and things like that. So that definitely, um, you know, gave me an appreciation for that and gave me a little crash course. It did not make me like consciously want to be a a teacher or anything. Uh, I think that more came from like working at a Boy Scout camp in the summers, but it certainly, um, 
helped shape my responsibility and just appreciation for what it takes to be a parent or guardian for sure. And, uh, what are, what are they doing now? Well, um, you don't need to feel uncomfortable about this. My sister actually just passed about three months ago in an accident. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so actually, uh, my nephew, her son is living with us now. Um, and then my brother works in the construction industry. He operates the big cranes and heavy equipment and stuff. So all sorts of, uh, big time stressful stuff, you know, lugging things that are 20,000 pounds and all mm. that kind of stuff. So were, were they cool growing up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, did, you, did you guys have fun? Even, even, we even did. given we, the uh, age difference between you? Sure. We did. But again, it was really more like in, or you watching them grow up. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I certainly, um, I absolutely enjoyed my time with them and, you know, playing silly little games and, uh, things like that. Uh, again, more in sort of like a uncle to, you know, nephew and niece dynamic, but I enjoyed that. And I, and I did have the appreciation for, you know, the little milestones they might have as kids growing up, like, you know, the first time they played a sport or, you know, going to one of their chorus concerts or something like that. I mean, but don't get me wrong. I was, you know, 17 year old senior in high school. There were certainly many times I rolled my eyes and kind of had exasperated sighs because there's certainly other things I'd rather have been doing. But I did, you know, I did have uh, fun with them, certainly. Now, Rick, I feel weird calling you Rick. <laughs> I understand. I also feel weird about calling you Mr. Dubois. <laughs> because, but for one, you're not, you have not been my teacher for five years. That's right. But I also, I also, I don't think I've ever, um, say, connected with you in such a way that it would feel comfortable calling you by your first name. That's all good. Uh, but, uh, Richard, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'll just go like, uh, maybe I'll just call you by your full name <laughs> or so. Mr. Richard, uh, <laughs> d- 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 Aaron, Eric Dubois. That's, I don't know what your middle name is. That's a good <laughs> guess though, right? Well, it's a 50% chance you're going to get it. Either you're right or you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, do you remember, what do you remember about m- having me in your class? Well, you know, I remember you, I can picture your exact seat in the back there Yep. and then kind of had your slouch, uh, but not a disrespectful slouch, just no, a it's settled just in slouch. Um, uh, my, like I had terrible, po- I never had good posture ever. Uh, <laughs> and that it like compounded to the point where <laughs> I just, I, my default in high school was just really bad slouching. Well, look and, at you now, and, you're doing a podcast and you have, uh. Exhibit A of good posture. Yeah, You've <laughs> got to have that microphone placement. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, um, as soon as you had reached out to me about, you know, getting together for this, I just kind of smiled and said, yeah, that sounds about right. Because I remember you very well that you did have a very, you know, detail oriented mind and, you know, could drill down into, you know, what's really going on here. So you had that, um, kind of very critical way of thinking about things and analytical. Um, but by the same token, I remember very well your kind of dry, I don't want to say sarcastic sense of humor because I think that kind of has a negative connotation of being like a little uh, mean spirited. That was never really the case, but I thought you had a, you know, a very dry, sharp wit. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was sort of my, my memory of you as soon as you reached out to me. And that's why I kind of just nodded my head when you had said that you were doing a podcast. Not being the douche who brought a guitar to class. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 not at all. No, that was, uh, um, I, I loved having you in class because I knew that every day you'd say something that would make me laugh and, <laughs> uh, and you handle business. So that's, that's really what it's about yeah. in life. You know, whatever path you choose, you got to do the things you got to do, you know, to, to handle business. Um, but you got to have fun along the way, you know, because the big moments, anybody can have fun in the big moments. Anybody can have fun if they go to Disney World or do a dream vacation somewhere. But those things are few and far between. You need to be able to laugh and enjoy the little moments because for every one big moment, there's 10,000 little moments. And, you know, those are the kind of interactions, just small little jokes in class that would come up and, you know, laughing at ourselves during a lab if it didn't go well or whatever. And, you know, so that's my recollection of having (laughs) you in class. Most of my energy was put into um, doing things for the lulls, for just do go. I, for some reason, I have, I have a penchant uh, for uh, this. I like watching people put so much time and energy into doing something for the joke. Yeah. Like um, Chris Hardwick is this comedian I like, and he once relayed this story about him and his um, 
friend, they would do this thing where they, they'd walk around with this huge prop and do the THX logo thing they, where they would um, do the, the right. Horn. Sure, right, 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 right. They would, and they would, they would, they spent like a whole day doing it, just carrying <laughs> this huge thing around in commitment. order to do the, do the joke. That's awesome. And I remember, I think I remember uh, one thing where I was um, stand, I was standing precariously on top of a desk, so I could. Um, Can you safely stand on top of a desk? I, I don't know. Uh, put a thing, what I think was a coffee filter on some kid's head named John. <laughs> and I, so I could, hey guys, put on it, Jonica. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> so you risk life and limb to do it. Yeah, I suppose. So better watch out because you could even lose. say I'm, sh- I'm studying arts and humanities in order to ruin my life for the joke. Or, hey, <laughs> again, it's all about commitment to the task. It's like, do you watch The Office? Uh, yes. One of my favorite um, Jim Halpert uh, pranks is the one where, again, this is sustained commitment to the task, where he was periodically putting uh, coins in uh, Dwight Schrute's. The head, the handset right. for the and phone? just gradually adding. Yeah. It would be heavier and heavier yeah. and heavier. And then finally, a couple months later, remember that episode? He took them all out. Yeah. So he'd slam into his yeah. head. <laughs> I, I love that long-term vision and, and that ability to see, wow. The this long gonna, con. That's right. This is going to pay off big time in two months. Or the, um, this might not have been like, um, say, a long con, but there was that episode where there was a cold open of Randall Park, the Asian actor. <laughs> he, yes. He was, uh, he was on Fresh Off the Boat now. Yes. He, he's like, they, they got this guy. It, it, in the in the, the narrative of the joke, they got this guy to act like Jim. Right. To like, uh, give a peck to Pam, right? And to, to, to just sit at his desk. He's like, "Wait, no, you, you're not Jim." That's right. <laughs> oh, I know. And, and they even swapped out the photo. Yeah, yeah the, <laughs> you know, you got much respect for the attention to detail. So I'm sure the the former physicist in you can appreciate that attention to detail. I don't think I was ever a physicist formally, but <laughs> <laughs> do you watch Hawaii Five O? Hawaii Five O, the new one, not the new one, nor the old one. Um, is it, it takes place in Hawaii and it's about, police. yeah, it's a CBS, yeah, CBS show. They had it out in like the seventies. It was a big sort of, you know, cop show, but with surfers and stuff. And then they rebooted it like, you know, cause that's sort of what you have to do with everything. Mm. Um, and one of the big things they had was they had a couple, uh, Korean American actors that were in the cast, but then after like a pretty good run of five or six years, they had some contract negotiation issues yeah. and basically weren't paying them as well. As, I remember one of them was Daniel Day Kim who left yes, the show. Right. And that's what I was thinking of. And the other one was, I think her name was Grace Park. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so. Um, well, now they have time to guest star and fresh off the boat. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't watched the show since they left, but I liked it. Yeah. I remember um, Daniel Day Kim used to be on Lost. Oh, I love you, that show. You ever watch? Oh, how Lost could I not? I mean. I like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and physics. So pretty much that show is kind of like all that wrapped into one just without the swords. <laughs> yeah. So I loved it. I remember being uh, the pilot blew, blew my mind. Oh, yeah. Big was, time. But also, even though it kind of fell off yeah. in quality towards the end, at the time, my young mind was still reeling in terms of they had all these different threads, these um, like minor details and towards the beginning of the series that they kind of did tie up. Right. Yeah. In, and in the end, and it, it was like, I thought, wow, you, I almost can't comprehend the, um, when you think of TV like that, you tend to think of it as we're just making up as we go along. Right. Because no one really knows if you're going to get renewed right. and such. But it did, even though they probably were making up as they go along, it looks like they did keep tabs on these threads that would, um, it, it would only make sense to tie them up if the show were to end. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I'm blown away by that as well. And I could just, I can just imagine in whatever room they meet, the, the size of the cork board that has the strings connecting everything, <laughs> you know. And actually, I think I remember reading an article about, um, the writers of the show and, you know, like the creative team in general actually asking for, um, like an end date because since it was such an ambitious project and nothing had really been done like that 
you know, it did, as you kind of alluded to, kind of went off the rails for a little bit. They, I remember reading some articles, they talked about the fact that, well, because we have all these, you know, um, diverse sort of mysterious storylines without having a sort of set end date, it's hard to productively move forward in a way that's engaging, but still allows them in an appropriate manner to kind of come back together. So I thought, so that kind of blew me away when I said, oh yeah, I suppose that would help to have that end date where you certainly don't want to think about that as a creator, I suppose, but by the same token, I understand how that probably made it easier for them to, okay, now that we know I have X amount of episodes to work with, now let's, you know, really map out the rest of it. Yeah. I loved it though. I thought it was great. Yeah. I did too. Um, back when I was watching it, uh, <laughs> but, um, have you always been, how long have you been a coach at Torrington high? All right. Well, let's see. So I just finished my, I think 22nd year of teaching and I've been at a few other schools before Torrington high school. And, um, there was a string of me coaching football, basketball, and track. Cause that's the fall season, the winter season and the spring season, there was a string of me doing football, basketball, and track for 36 seasons in a row. But then ultimately, as I got older and got married and had a kid, I didn't have the time or the energy. Um, and I just wanted to spend time with my wife and kids. So I started to pull back from it a little bit. I uh, took basketball off because that was in the middle in the winter. So mm-hmm. that way I, I didn't have one long uninterrupted stretch of coaching. And then I stepped back from football because that was the most time consuming as my kid got older and you know, I started taking him to his activities because I didn't want to miss out on that. And then um, you became his coach. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and But he didn't want he didn't want any part of that. Like you yeah. certainly do read about some of the kids that are coached by their dad, but my son wasn't feeling that. Um, <laughs> and then so for a while, I was only doing track. But then again, as my son continued to get even older, um, you know, I took my, I don't say my, took my job as a dad because I love being a dad. But having said that, there's responsibility that goes with it. I took it very seriously. So one of the pieces of advice I got from a coach who was about 20 years ahead of me. Were you there when Mr. Cassinets was a health PE teacher? I think he might've been gone by the time you. I don't recognize the name. Yeah. He, he retired, um, a while, obviously must've been more than five years ago. Um, and he was a longtime football coach and the advice he gave me, which I'm glad I took was don't spend so much time raising other people's kids. You're not there for your own kid. Hmm. And so I kind of got out of coaching for a while, but now that my son's older, he's in the middle school, doesn't need or want me around all the time. <laughs> um, so I'm, I've gotten back into football. So that's sort of my long winded way of um, saying I've coached almost 50 seasons um, between football, basketball and track. Not quite. I think it's like 45, 46, something like that. So long time of being on the sidelines or being on the court. Now, as someone who is not very sports oriented sure. or physically fit, <laughs> um, that sounds like a whole lot of <laughs> misery time I would put towards something else. <laughs> sure, sure. Absolutely. You know, and, um, and I know you're not saying otherwise, but you know, we're lots of things, you know, so I, I certainly have other interests, but yeah. I have not pursued them to the level that I have coaching because it's so time consuming. And just by the nature of the sports I do, like coaching football is different from any other sport out there. Like it to varying degrees, it's year round, mm-hmm. you know, with the off season lifting and running and things like that. Yeah. Like I talked to you about earlier. I mean, yesterday I spent five hours on the football field or in the weight room and it's, it was July 24th. Um, so the season doesn't officially start for, you know, six more weeks. Um, you know, for me, when I grew up playing sports, I did it just for the enjoyment of it. You know, no real deep reflection on, hey, this is going to help me get lifelong lessons, blah, 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 nothing. I just enjoyed myself and the time with my teammates and challenging myself. But, you know, as I've gotten older, I really, I recognize that sports aren't for everyone, as you kind of just mentioned, but. I'm more of a reader. Yeah, (laughs) well, I try to do both. Um, Actually, I got two books going right now. But so for me, coaching is really a vehicle to help kids become the best people they can be. You know, so. Um, I probably, if you look over the course of a year, I spend just as much time or more time following up with kids, either with sort of serious, more in depth kind of discussions or just kind of small little moments of how are they doing in their classes? How are things going? How's life going? Um, you know, I, I look at coaching as a vehicle to help kids grow. So in that sense, it's not a lot of time. 
you know? So, uh, cause otherwise I wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be worth the money. You know, right. I could, I could put in the same amount of hours doing a job anywhere, making minimum wage, and I would make more money than I do coaching. So mm-hmm. I do the coaching because I see how for some kids it transforms their lives. Mm-hmm. And, for, and even for kids who already are on a good path and things are going well for them to be part of something that for them enriches their life. That's awesome. You know, but you know, I certainly over the years have recognized the important role that coaches can play for some of the kids who have come from unstable homes and maybe didn't have a strong parental or male figure in their life or didn't have someone who held them accountable. And, but while holding them accountable, did it because they had the big picture vision and faith that, Hey, you can do a lot with your life. Um, so for me, it's a lot of time, but I couldn't see doing it any other way. I suppose I have a small glimpse into what it's like to say, be an athlete, have a coach in terms of, uh, like being a musician. When you think of someone who's like really serious, like some kind of prodigy at their instrument, they're spending most of their time practicing, getting lessons from, uh, from their, uh, their instructor and just really working at that. Although I don't think there might not, there might not be that much of a sense of community, say with an athlete and a coach. Have you ever seen the movie Whiplash? I have not. It's uh, from 2014. It's about this kid who's a jazz drummer okay. who goes off to school and is like just terrorized, berated by this really aggressive music instructor mm, yep. who runs this like real tip top shape sure. um, ensemble who only ever really wants the best out of his, his players, right? His students that are in the ensemble and, uh, Spoiler alert, um, <laughs> he, uh, he makes people cry and because he's J.K. Simmons, but also, oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yep. But also, like, the kid gets him fired because he thinks, oh, he's just too aggressive. Out to get me, yeah. Or not, oh, not, not quite, but okay. in a way, you could think of it as, um, by the end of the movie, he does redeem himself in, right. the, in the eyes of, um, J.K. Simmons, mm-hmm. uh, J. John Jameson, and uh, you know, that was not his name in the movie. <laughs> but uh, it's um, he explains his reasoning behind it as like the two most harmful words in the English language are "good job." the The reason why he was he is so aggressive and um, almost. Uh, abusive is because he wants to be able to push these kids to their limits because he and them, all of them want themselves to be the best musicians they can be. And you can't really do that. If you're patronizing them, you could say by just saying, Oh man, that was great. Even if it wasn't. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, the parallel you make with, um, you know, becoming a high level mu- musician and, uh, being an athlete, I think there is a lot of commonality. And ultimately, anything that you pursue with passion that you can grow with, but takes hard work and discipline, in that sense, the things are exactly the same. It's just a matter of where specifically you're following that. And I think um, one of the things that I love about coaching is every kid is unique and every kid comes to you with a different background, different levels of skill, different levels of confidence and different goals ultimately. And, you know, I think as a coach, I, again, cause for me, coaching is a vehicle to help the kids. Yes. I love football and I love the basketball and track when I coach them, but I did it to help kids. I didn't do it because I couldn't hang up the cleats and I was, you know, upset and bitter that, you know, I couldn't play anymore, but I just had such a passion for that specific sport that I had to keep going. It wasn't that. So for me, what I love about coaching is I can do both. So for the kid who wants to get to that highest level that you kind of mentioned, like with musicianship, for the kid who wants to get to the highest level, I can push them, you know, to that, to that level and, and hold them ultra accountable for every little tiny detail that someone else might not even recognize but just because I've been coaching for forever, I can see, no, you were two inches off there. And those kind of, I can do that. But for the kid who does not have those kind of aspirations and has never been part of something, 
but they're pushing their boundaries and then trying something, especially a team sport like football. And they've never um, challenged themselves physically or in a sustained way to push themselves. Um, so for that kid being part of the team, you know, that is what they're there for. So, you know, I think that you know, each of those kids can find their place and I can help each of those kids, but it's not necessarily all about, it has to be the best or nothing. You know, I think for me, I'm going to soapbox a little bit here as a coach. One of the things I can't stand is the quote unquote premier leagues and things that are out there where we have these, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 year old kids that are traveling all over the state to participate in these tournaments um, because mom and dad think that they're, that's the key to get them a scholarship. And then, so now you have all these kids that some of them go on to that and some of them have the drive for that, but lots of kids don't. And then they get turned off from those kind of things. And then that door closes in their life because they had such a miserable experience when if it wasn't go, 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 you know, they could have pursued it the way that fit for them. Then all of a sudden they could be someone who has a lifelong enjoyment of getting out and running or doing active sports and that maybe, you know, and they continue to meet people that way. And, uh, so I, I appreciate and respect the people that have that drive that want to be the best at whatever they're doing. Awesome. Get after it. Uh, and I appreciate anyone that helps them do that. But I also do have respect for people that that's not their driving, like, especially as a track and field coach, you know, cause one of the sayings is, uh, the stopwatch doesn't lie or the, or the tape measure doesn't lie. Meaning like, you can tell how fast people are and how how good they are because you literally measure exactly how far they threw something or how far they jumped. But over the years, I've had plenty of kids that they told me that they really just wanted the day-to-day conditioning and being in the camaraderie and being with the groups. They had zero desire to compete. Their version of success in their life did not was not influenced at all by what a time and a stopwatch was or if they edged out the person next to them in a race. And I love being able to help both of those kids. So that was a really long winded, uh, <laughs> answer to whatever you had. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. So I think you're not that far removed from, uh, a lot of the athletes. And I would, I would say kind of going back to before when you're kind of beating yourself up about, you know, it kind of took you a while to identify the path you're following and, you know, you kind of you know, are frustrated that, you know, it's taking you a little longer to get there. I would say that's the exact same thing that I see with athletes that, you know, maybe, um, you know, came to a sport later in life or got a, you know, an increased level of commitment to it later on in life. Um, it's the same kind of motivation, you know, they're, they're looking to take their craft as far as they can, which is awesome. And that's why I loved that, um, Peter Jackson book I was telling you about because a lot of the book is just letters that he was relentlessly writing because I'm sure you know he does all his stuff in New Zealand Mm -hmm. and he basically created the film industry there because for all intents and purposes it didn't really exist before him Mm -hmm. the way I understand it and a lot of it just came from his sheer iron will of this is something I love to do and this is happening now let me just figure out and so he was just writing letter after letter after letter you know trailblazing a path you know and, and creating things in New Zealand, it didn't exist before because he loved it. And that's, you know, you're doing the same thing. Like you said yourself, like, Hey, I had to get this equipment. I'm figuring out as we go, I'll figure out all the editing stuff as I go. That's, that's awesome. That's what it's about, you know? Yeah. But it's not exactly me trying to, um, permanently change an industry. Uh, if anything, it's really more for myself because I don't know how much you know about podcasting. Uh, pretty much what I've learned from talking to you. Uh, is it, no one makes money from this, uh, right. or at least not unless it gets really big and sure. you have people offering you like sponsorships and stuff. Right. But for the most part, this is podcasts like this are just started by schmucks like me <laughs> who are like, Hey, I have a couple of mics and right. someone to talk to. Well, I figured there wasn't money in it because to get a schmuck like me on, <laughs> it can't be connected to money. So it's a two way schmuck street. So I will nod respectfully as we pass each no, other. But especially because, um, when you want to get your podcast out there, you have to find a service to host right. your 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 content. Sure. And a lot of them are not free. Mm-hmm. They uh, cost a bit of money for you to host host your content there, but also distribute it to all the places where he, people get their podcasts. Right. And so if you if you're not big enough to 
say, get some to have people offering you sponsorships and stuff. In the end, most anyone who's who uh, has a podcast is running a podcast. They are losing money. You know, right? Yeah, you know. But I guess if you're pursuing something you're passionate about, you're just investing in yourself. If it's something you enjoy and it enriches your life, and and the world is moved by passionate people anyway. You know, so whatever. Whatever you do, if you do it with enthusiasm and you do it well or to the best of your ability, I, I firmly believe that, um, without getting all cosmic here or whatever, you know, I firmly believe that that helps, that helps society. You know, some ways obviously are more direct than others, but, um, passionate people, they find their ways to make their imprint on society. So it might not be directly changing an industry. Uh, and if I remember right with the Peter Jackson book, it wasn't necessarily that he was trying to change an industry. He just knew what he wanted to do. Kind of like you were just saying with the podcast. He just knew he wanted to make movies and he did whatever he had to do to do it. So I wouldn't say I know what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <clears throat> I mean, it's just the, the format and my intention for this is rather amorphous when, like say, when I'm trying to reach out to people to come on, the first question they have is, oh, what's it about? <laughs> right. What's it? I, and then like, uh, I'll tell them, well, the title is the bot, the podcast. There you go. With Benson Ty. There you go. Because I know no one, I'm pretty sure no one's taking that. And there's not really a theme or a topic of focus. Like say, if I were only inviting people on to talk about music. Right. You know, it's, um, this is, I, I want to keep this so, the format so, as loose as possible. The only real consistency re- here really is it's a one-on-one kind of interview, right. mostly because I have a setup for two mics and that's it. <laughs> but you know, it's um, this is kind of interviewee, but I don't necessarily want it to be that. Like when I when I reached out to you, I did. Sure. I told you it's not. I don't want it. I want it to be more of a conversation. Yeah, I think it has a been. back and forth between us. Sure. I like. I don't come with questions prepared. Um. And enough, the only real questions I have, quote unquote, prepared to ask everyone is just where are you from? Where'd you go to school? Right. Those are the only real things I carry between between the recordings. But this is mainly me trying to have conversations with people in order to feed my curiosity, to connect with them, and also to sometimes get out of the house. Yeah. Well, you know, I think... Uh you know, when you just said like, you know, you didn't have a set kind of theme or whatever, I think, um, with anything that you're pursuing, if it's something that's in depth and, you know, has a lot of room for growth, you know, to kind of use the buzz phrase, you know, like it, it has to kind of organically grow. So I think it's, you know, as you continue to, to do this and reflect on it more and just, you know, kind of learn from, the podcast you've done and kind of see the parts that you really liked and things, you might find that kind of naturally, you do sort of end up with a kind of theme, even if it's not a theme of the guests, there might be a theme of, you know, where you try to, where the conversation tends to go, or maybe it, maybe there won't be. Um, but I, it, anything that, um, has a level of complexity to it, I think you do need to sort of monitor and adjust and see how it goes. Like again, in football coach mode, just two days ago, I was at the head coach's house for two hours. We were talking about the different kind of, and I know, like you said, you didn't really have sports in your background, but um, we were talking about the different sort of defensive philosophies that we wanted to do. And just in the normal conversation back and forth and drawing some things up on the board, where we ended up two hours later was very different than where we started. Yeah. You know, I think anything you do that has some depth to it, you know, you just sort of see where it takes you. But if you're not adventurous enough to dive in, um, I, I, that's why I love the way you just said, like, I'm figuring out as I go and I just bought the equipment and I'm learning as I go. I love that because I think so many people shy away from things that they could love and create some great memories for themselves because they feel they're not equipped for it, you know, and that. Yeah, that was, that was 2015 me. Yeah. And that's it. And, and again, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating for someone to, you know, try and become like a parkour world champion without doing some training ahead of time. There's certainly some safety due diligence you need to do depending what you're pursuing. But when all is said and done, you know, find something that speaks to you and just dive in and figure it out as you go. Yeah. Actually, I'm kind of glad I didn't start it four years ago because 
I bought all this equipment and I had this idea. Oh, I'm going to start a podcast and right. cause I love podcasts and whatever. Sure. But I feel like I didn't have enough experience as a person at that point in order to say carry a conversation for a prolonged period of time or to speak in a way that's not, um, very worldly worldly or just filled with me trying to gather my thoughts at some point in during my life i i purposely wanted to streamline the way words fall out of my face because like most anyone that age i was very the act of speech was very squirrely sure in the sense that there's so many filler words um i'm the uh, words coming out of my mouth were almost incoherent just because I was young and dumb and uh, <laughs> didn't have a way to express my thoughts. I spent a lot of time, say, reading, but also trying to get a grip on English, even though it is, you could call, I would, I've been speaking English since I was, you know, born. But on order, day one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Man, you are advanced. <laughs> I'm pretty sure eh, is a word. <laughs> that's right. That's you can right. Spell that. <laughs> there you go. See. No, but uh, I mean, in, uh, sure, you might hear a bunch of is in the middle of my speech, but I did. I I was very purposeful in trying to train myself to um, take pauses, to uh, pay attention to whoever I was talking to, and try to make sure that the con- the whatever conversation I was having flowed a bit more due to my um my lack of uh squirreliness in terms of speech. Well, I think that's great and I think ultimately it points to uh and if, if it's the right word uh, like empathetic nature of you know, wanting to have a meaningful conversation with someone rather than just like you said, just squirrely kind of spitting things out. And I think that kind of comes with, well, for people that are willing to embrace it, which you have, that comes with being a little older and having a little time to reflect. Um, Because I think when you're younger, uh, you know, it's go, 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 go. There's, and I don't think this is a bad thing. I think it's kind of natural for the level of development for, you know, teenagers or whatever is there's not a lot of reflection going on. You know, you are more, you meaning teenagers are more impulsive and just sort of in the moment right now. Um, so I think that kind of could lead to that sort of, you know, stream of consciousness way of talking. Uh, so I think that's a normal progression for people that are thoughtful and is to, you know, kind of move in that direction. You know, I think the, um, kind of the phrase, I don't know if you've heard it, like youth is wasted on the young. Yeah. I think I feel, um, you know, as someone who's 47, you know, do the math. I'm probably on the back, the back half now for me. (laughs) Um, so, you know, I'm half dead guys. That's right. That's right. (laughs) So weekend at Bernie's four. Um, I don't even know. I know they did two. I don't know if they ever did a third. I think think there was only two. (laughs) Yeah. But I, I didn't know like if some of those movies, like, you know, you get to sort of like a off-brand one where they don't even have the original actors anymore and they just sort of keep cranking them out. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that phrase, like the youth is wasted on the young, I think it's kind of harsh because I, but I do understand where it comes from. Like as a 47-year-old who has been through a lot of sort of different experiences in life, I can certainly have a, a greater appreciation for you know, maybe some quote unquote missed opportunities or things that are fleeting in life. Um, But I think it's a little harsh to say like youth is wasted on the young because I think that's part of the process. You know, I don't think it's reasonable to expect a teenager to be deeply introspective and those, yes, you can expect them to be a good human being. um, But, you know, I don't think it's realistic to expect a 23 year old who's had a little more time to step back and reflect on things. You know, I don't think it's, realistic for them to be able to just be there instantly so um well t- i'll tell you this sometimes this is not very uh introspective or or very or deep or whatever the format does tend to skew a bit towards like deepish interviews sure but i wouldn't i totally wouldn't mind if every guest i had on we spent half the time trying to make each other laugh <laughs> yeah well 
again, connecting with people, there's a, there's a lot of time in a day. There's no reason that you can't, you know, have your nose at the grindstone, do what you have to do professionally. Um, and you can still laugh and you can still challenge yourself with your different hobbies and get out and walk the dog. And, you know, there's time for all that. There's time for all that. So that makes sense, you know, and, and I think ultimately the most fun people to be around are the ones that in the span of five minutes, you can go from talking about like, obviously episodes four through six for star Wars are the best. And then three <laughs> minutes later, you know, talking about sort of current, um, societal issues, you know, like there's, there's time for all of that. Yeah. And I think it ultimately makes for, um, a more interesting life when you can appreciate it on multiple levels. You know, I, um, I can laugh at all sorts of silly, stupid things, but then be moved by something, you know, really deep and thought provoking. It's all part of life. Yeah. I think we fit enough of, of everything in this, in, in the session. Yeah. It's been nice to uh, catch up like this. And it, you know, again, going back to what I had said about, you know, I love Torrington and I feel strongly about um, the kids I work with. It, you know, makes me really happy to see, just from our time of reconnecting today, the, the path that you're on, because I see that you are, you know, doing what speaks to you and you're not holding yourself back by the fact that you don't have it all figured out, you know, uh, figuring out as you go. And I love that. And that's, you know, that, that, that helps give me the energy as a teacher, because that's what I want my kids to do. I want them to do whatever the heck it is they want to do. And, to have the confidence that, all right, let's do this. Let's figure it out. Yeah. So I've, I've enjoyed coming down here. I was taking a nap right before I came. <laughs> so you did cut the nap short, but that's okay. All right. Well, uh, I guess we're done. Uh, thanks all for right. coming on. Oh, it's been awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, uh, good luck. Keep on rocking. All right. Thanks. Thanks.